Um, wow, it's loud. Wow. Um, okay, hi everyone. So I'm going to um, talk about work. It's actually based on a sequence of papers. Um, the most recent of which, are, with, uh, of which are with Yuval Rabani and my student uh, Spencer and. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of introduction uh, that's been really helpful by Arnab in the morning and some other things. So I'll just skim through this very quickly. Um, we have Bayesian networks. Uh, their visible variables are always called V and they could be all kinds of configurations. But for the purpose of this um, talk, um, there's, we're going to have in mind the situation where there's just a hidden, a single hidden variable uh, U. And the structure of the network in general could be all kinds of things. As you saw in Arnab's talk, she gave a bunch of uh, examples, and Yuval will develop that uh, more thoroughly, more extensively in the in the lecture to come. So I'm I'm really going to say actually virtually nothing about this about co about causality and the structure of what happens in a causal network in this talk because that will come up in the in the subsequent talk. The notation I'm going to be using throughout throughout the talk today is just this uh, p is the distribution, the, the visible distribution. So with the distribution induced on, on the, uh, the visible uh, variables V, and this is what you would learn from the data. P of course is Markovian on the graph. So it can be expanded always as uh, the, the product, lowercase is going to mean some assignment of the product over vertices. So the probability they take this uh, value conditioned on their parents. And this list of conditional probabilities, this is, these are the parameters of the model. So um, the identification problem or parameter learning problem that's sometimes called is something like this. You're given the distribution to all the variables. In other words, you're given uh, uh, the distribution even including the hidden variables, weren't hidden. You could easily identify the parameters of the model and easily here is, um, at least it's at least it's uh, it's logically easily. And Arnab was talking about, you know, the statistical issues can be non-trivial, but but the, the, the logical side of this is quite easy. Um, what if you are actually only given P uh, or an empirical approximation there to on the visible variables, what can you determine? And uh, part of the beauty of this theory is, uh, is that there is this uh, amazing algorithm, which uh, some of the contributors are here in the room, um, where you know, you can, that exactly determines all possible uh, effects which are do affect which are in fact implied by by the uh, by the by the data. The thing is that, of course, uh, and I'm sort of beating a tired horse here. I think after Arnab's talk is that you know sort of in most cases this, you can't do this. You know you really need a lot of sparsity. You really need these assumptions to hold very strictly and so forth. And that's kind of part of uh, what, what's hard here. And so. Um, you know, in this case, in this graph, you can figure out P of V3 do uh, V1. In this, in this graph, you certainly cannot. Um, and in fact, in this graph, since the hidden variable broadcasts to all other variables, so all of them could be affected by this latent. In fact, this hidden variable could generate any probability distribution on the graph. There need not be any signal signaling carried by the directed edges at all. It could be just that the hidden variable is completely dictating what's happening in the network. And you just have this illusion that there's something causal happening, but in fact, uh, it's all being handled by, uh, by, by the, what's the, the man behind the curtain. So you've seen the Wizard of Oz. Okay, so um, you can generate any distribution, but this requires, and here's where we're looking to kind of break some of these assumptions, or not break, but add to our assumption list a little bit so that we can make some things possible that otherwise are not possible. In order to do that, U actually needs to range over a very large set. So if there are n variables here, and I'll assume throughout this talk that these variables are binary, then in order to really dictate just an arbitrary probability uh, uh, distribution there, you would have to range over a, a set of size two to the n, where n is the number of, of variables, okay? So that's kind of a very extravagant cost. And so the hope is that by, not being so extravagant by placing some limitation there, you might actually be able to learn some things that you otherwise cannot. So this kind of cardinality or dimension bound is, is, uh, is a, you know, it's actually a really kind of long-standing assumption in, in uh, various areas. I just don't think it's been, been done here. Um, 
Uh, and we're going to let K throughout this talk be the cardinality, you know, be the range of you, the number of values that you can take on. And we're gonna ask ourselves, what can we do? And we're going to be interested in actually a hierarchy of three problems of increasing generality um, as follows. So uh, this problem I'm going to describe over here is going to be the, uh, the K, mix, K mix prod. So that means it's a mixture of uh, product distributions where the mixture has K mixture components. So U is picking out the mixture component. Conditional on U, the values at these vertices are of course independent as indicated by this graph. Okay, so there's no further structure beyond what's carried. Uh, there's no, uh, by, the, by, the, by the unknown value of this, this latent. So it's a mixture of K uh, uh, product distributions, K mix prod. And that's a special case of sort of more general things that, we'll, that Yuval will talk about in his talk, which are what's the, what happens when you have a mixture of K more general distributions. And I'll, I'll leave that for later. So these are the two more ambitious problems that um, we'll, we're going to be mostly, uh, that I'll focus mostly on this one, you've all mostly on this one. But let me mention a, a simpler problem, which is already, um, turns out to be uh, interesting and turns out to be necessary for, the, the, uh, for our work, which is uh, the K-mix IID. So K-mix IID is a special case of the K-mix product, but it's just a special case where each of these, vert these variables VI um, it, they're not just independent uh, conditional on the latent, but they're even, or well, they're also identically distributed conditional on the latent. Okay, so it's an extremely morally simple model, uh, very few parameters, but it's a, it's a, um, turns out to be a really important problem to, to think about. Okay, so in this lecture, I'll just talk about these two problems. So the plan for the lecture is like this. Um, first, I'll talk for a little while about this very kind of conceptually easy problem a relatively simple problem, K-mix IED. It turns out to actually have a little more interest than you would maybe suspect if you haven't thought about these things before. I'll tell you about this wonderful uh, algorithm, Prony. Well, I, I won't actually have time to do it, but if you want, you can do it on the side. Uh, I'll talk about Henkel matrices. And then uh, I'll mention one result, which um, goes back about eight years that we proved, uh, is, is, a, is a sample complexity lower bound on this problem um, that, which puts it into the, this uh, complexity. And, the, you know, so for K-mix IID, we have a really good lower bound. And then we also um, have an upper bound through this algorithm prony. So I'll establish some base there. And then the second part of the lecture, maybe more of the lecture is gonna focus on this more general problem, K-mix prod. And I'll tell you about two concepts that are important there. One algorithmic concept is this method of synthetic bits. And one, the kind of more analytic uh, uh, thing we, I want to tell you about is these matrices we'll call Hadamard extensions, which are somehow a multivariate generalization of uh, Vandermond matrices and Henkel matrices, which, which are the, the role. In, okay. And we'll give you um, an almost matching upper bound to match the lower bound for this simple problem. We'll get the uh, almost matching uh, upper bound for the more general problem. Okay, so that's our plan. So uh, what's can we, what's the story with K-mix IID? So K-mix IID is intimately re related to a classical problem in analysis uh, known as the moment problem um, where you have, um, well, all right, let me start from here. So U after all is distributed on, you know, these K possibilities according to some prior pi that you don't know. And we're just, again, for this lecture, focusing just on the case that the VIs are all binary which means that for each VI, and actually there's only a single one because they're, they're identically distributed, there's just this probability that V sub I is equal to one uh, given that, uh, you know, given each of the K values that you can take on, right? So depending on the value of little u, uh, there's a probability M sub u that this variable is equal to one. Since they're conditionally independent, the probability that if you have some set capital R of these variables, the probability that they're all equal to one is just M sub U to the power R. And so if you write down the number of head, think of the ones as heads, uh, toss and coins, you get heads. If you write down Y as just the number of heads that you see, then the moments, so this is now an integer valued random variable and its moments are linear combinations of the moments of what I'll call this K spike or uh, atomic uh, distribution. So it's a distribution on the unit interval with has uh, which has support, uh, finite support cardinality K. 
And it's just the sum of these K delta functions. Uh, they're weighted by the prior and they're the, these sort of spikes, the atoms are at the locations according to these, these distributions. Okay, so this would be a two spike distribution. It has a certain amount of weight at uh, 0 0.1 and another certain amount of weight at 0 0.9, K spike distribution. And the point is that um, the, the, in this, in our situation that we care about in this model, k mix ID, that we care about the, the kind of variables that we're interested in are, are you know, y, the number of heads, it's, it's all exchangeable. So the only thing that matters is the symmetric function. So you just care about it. Um, but these moments are, they're not quite the same as, but they're related by simple linear transformation to the moments of this k spike distribution on the real one. Okay. So this means that if you want to learn the K-mix ID problem, you reduce it somehow to just learning a distribution on the real line, or in fact, on the union interval from its moments. Okay, so this is a wonderful problem. I'll just mention for pedagogical uh, value, sort of what's known about this problem, because we can see it. So these things have been worked out. Uh, if, I'm if you're given, the first question you can ask is just, if I'm given a list of moments, are they in fact the moments of any kind of distribution on the real line? There's a beautiful answer. The answer is that you write down those moments in this, in this symmetric matrix where the moments appear on these sort of uh, anti-diagonals. And there's such a probability distribution exists if and only if uh, for all values of K, right? So this is actually an infinite object. If and only if for all values of K, when you take this upper left-hand corner, it is semi-definite. And the measure is also unique, provided the mu's don't grow too fast, but for us, that's going to be guaranteed because we have a compactly supported distribution. So now that was true for any probability distribution. We're interested in this K-spike formulation. So what's special in the K-spike formulation? So the answer is that you need exactly two K minus one moments, and then you don't need any more. That's, if you just count degrees of freedom, you know that should be the answer, but it, you know, it takes uh, doing. Um, so you only need the number of visible variables to be 2k minus one. And uh, there's this amazing, just wonderful algorithm of Crony, 225 year old algorithm that um, tells you exactly how to work this out. It's, it's very simple, but it's just wonderful. So I'm not going to cover that right now unless somebody uh, insists. So this solves the k mix IID problem kind of in principle. You know, you have that you collect your statistics, you gather them in you know, moments, and you invert and you figure out what your what your uh, parameters of your model were, those m sub u's and the, and the prior distribution pi. Um, that's if you live here. Um, we didn't live there for too long. So um, we actually need to control uh, the dependence also on sample size. Um, so the, it's been actually discussed for kind of a long time. This, this is clear sure people mention how you know, Prony's algorithm is very unstable, but uh, I couldn't find any, we couldn't find any quantification of that actually. And so um, that was the content of a lower bound that we proved in 2014. And I'll just mention it now. So I should say that if you want to reconstruct the parameters of the distribution, um, there's an instability, there's inherent instability of the problem. I have these, this K-spike distribution. If I bring two of those spikes arbitrary close to each other, I can't resolve that, okay? So there, the, there's a, there's a if you want to reconstruct parametric uh, reconstruction, you depend upon that separation parameter. We'll call that separation parameter zeta. And we have, there's a lower bound in terms of that separation parameter. So um, you require this, your empirical distribution to be within that zeta to the power k, um, in order to even uh, determine the parameters at all, even to within plus minus uh, one over K, which is about as coarse as you can ask for, since everything lives in the unit uh, interval. So there's an implied, so, so you must have a, a same, and the sample size is the same as one over the distribution, difference, distance and distributions, basically. So, uh, so this gives us an exponent, this gives you an exponential lower bound on, uh, on sample size. Um, or any of the problems that we're talking about, because this is the easiest of the family of problems we're going to be talking about. Maybe the K-mix prod and then more to come. Okay. 
that same paper that we wrote back then also gave an upper bound of one over zeta to the k squared, but that's that's been since improved. And also um, there's more work, and I'm not gonna talk about this, on reconstructing things in transportation distance. Uh, and I'm just gonna set that aside and happy to talk about it. Um, so I wanna move on because I really wanna talk about the problem that's uh, the more interesting, the more ambitious problem of this k-mix pro uh, problem. So uh, here's again the picture of the diagram, but now the V's, if, you're, if you've managed to doze off, the wake up, because now the V's have nothing to do with each other. There's no exchangeability, they're not there. They're, um, so this is a model with more parameters, of course. So you have a prior, there's still a prior pi on the hidden variable, that's unchanged. Uh, but now in order to fully describe the, the problem, the parameters of the problem, you have not, a row basically of biases, but uh, for each ver for each uh, visible variable, he has a bias. You know, he has a probability of heads given each value of the hidden variable. So this gives you an n by k matrix. And again, n is the number of uh, variables here, are four, and and k is again the number of uh, hidden uh, number of values taken by the hidden variable. Okay, so the input to the problem, the the, the family of parameters is that n by k matrix and the prior. So there's been work of the, on this, of course. Um, mo the prior work mainly focused on what's called learning rather than identifying. So I'll use those words. So for those who are not sort of in the, you know, it's like secret handshake. So um, it, not only that, but not everybody agrees on the handshake. But it, like learning means, you know, reproducing the, distribu to the, the distribution in some sense and identifying means source identification, means parameter learning, okay? So, um, so um, that's kind of the code word here. And identifying is a harder goal in a more restricted set of circumstances, okay? So in general, you can't identify it, uh, as I mentioned, if you have some large. So, so you have to be in sort of a nicer region of parameter space, which also offers the opportunity for, um, for uh, faster runtime, perhaps, because you don't actually have to run on all the same inputs that you would have to. Um, and we're gonna want to do that in anywhere where there's a stable invertibility guarantee. So uh, it has to be something like this, if the distance uh, between, you know, if two models generate sufficiently, um, if they're if they're far, if they're a little bit away in parameter space, then they also have to gen generate distributions that are recognizably away from each other, in the you know in the distribution space in which you which you observe. Okay, this is, this is the only case where it makes sense to sort of ask for uh, identification. So. Um, Okay, just, you know, people have worried about parameter identification going back a long way. These are the references I could find. Um, identification for us is really the right problem to worry about if you have in mind some kind of causal uh, motivation in the back of your mind that you're gonna take this network and then, you know, maybe intervene on it or something. So it seems like for our purposes, the right problem. But both of them make sense, obviously. There is tons of literature on learning mixture models not just in the continuous space where there's probably a uh, case where there's probably even more literature, but even in the discrete space, there's uh, a lot of literature. And I, I, I tried to cram some fraction of that onto this slide. Um, the, maybe the most um, relevant to us is a line of work beginning with basic Freund Mansur and Brian Goldberg and Goldberg. And then um, there's a really, important paper by Feldman and Donald Cervetio uh, in 2008 on, uh, well, a little bit earlier in the conference version, anyway, on learning mi these mixture models. And then the most recent uh, on that is Chen and Moitra, uh, who Im improved the complexity there. So I just want, this is all in the context, all these things are in the context of learning. And I just wanna say one thing about that, which is, what those algorithms have to do is they have to do a certain gridding. At some point you do all kinds of nice things. And at some point you have to kind of do a search. You have to do grid space and you kind of look at some uh, search and uh, that's expensive. You know, I mean, there's just, uh, that's kind of an expensive way to do things. Um, and it, it's a big question to my mind, whether it's avoidable, but it gives you these kinds of complexities, some function of N but then the main thing that, because we're really focused on this parameter k, is you get this uh, exponential in k cubed in those in those complexities. Um, so, um, 
we're going to not to want to not pay that kind of exponential fee. Um, and we, you know, we don't do it for those learning, but we can do that for identification. So um, we're going to study this KMIX prod under a zeta separation assumption. It's the same kind of assumption I wrote on a previous slide. It just now applies to every variable individually. So every variable has to be basically sensitive to the values of the hidden variable. It has no good to have an observable. If that observable is not sensitive to the hidden variable, it's not going to help you to learn anything about the model. So it's kind of a thing. So every one of the variables we want to be sensitive. It turns out it's enough that enough of them are, but talk about that. Um, it was shown um, in a nice paper that's completely algebraic uh, just a few years ago by Tomasebe, Motahari, and Mada Ali. Um, that this mapping from the model to the uh, you know to the distribution space to the, or to the moments uh, uh, is uh, injective. So it's in other words, you have identifiability even if zeta is equal to zero. Okay, which just means that you have distinct values in each row of this matrix. Um, so even then, that's enough to identify the model up to some obvious symmetries like relabeling the variable. Um, and it's clear that you need that, um, even in this more general, okay, it was clear in the ID case, but it's also clear here, you could have two columns that are just completely identical, of course, so of the, in other words, two variables that behave, um, uh, I mean, sorry, two assignments of the hidden variable that are behaving identically, so you, there's no way you could learn that. So um, it turns out that uh, this assumption is actually more than is necessary. So. Spencer and I have a separate paper showing that identify, identifiability still holds under more of a like a whole type condition where you have enough separations. But that's kind of an aside. So if you're if you're curious, I mean, you should not take if you're interested in these things, you should not take it as as like you know this is the kind of world you have to operate in. Uh, there are better things we could do, but we don't understand the full range of that. And this other result that we have is completely non-algorithmic as well. Okay, so I'm just going to keep talking about the algorithm. Okay, so um, these are really interesting open problems to. to... So let me just uh, now focus for my remaining. Oh, good. So for the remaining time, um, let me just focus on like what our algorithm <coughs> is for this uh, kind of model. Okay, so we're going to suppose we're so now we have this KMIX uh, product uh, problem. Um, we're going to suppose for what we do uh, for the rest of the talk that we have at least uh, 3k minus 3 uh, of observable variables. You can do with less, but uh, you can do 2k minus 1, but then you pay in the runtime. So I'll, we'll assume we have 3k minus 3. And we're going to do what you would hope. We're going to identify the model. Um, it's going to be within some plus minus epsilon of the, of the true model. And the runtime is going to be sort of as promised. There's going to be this, the, the exponent is just k log k and uh, with some low order uh, other stuff. So what's the main challenge in trying to do an algorithm like this? Well, I, I, I think there's, a, there's like a real basic, uh, you know, conceptual challenge, which is how, how do you use uh, these observables that have kind of nothing to do with each other in their behavior, right? So beforehand we had, they were IID. So it was kind of an obvious variable. I called it Y was the number of heads. Everything was exchangeable. So there was a symmetric function. So it was kind of an obvious thing to, to, to use. Um, um, so it was kind of clear what to do. It was clear what information you had at your disposal and it translated into this one dimensional um, kind of model. But now these variables behave quite differently and it's not clear how to aggregate uh, that information. So, um, so for the purpose of, um, so there's a nice way of doing that. And for the purpose of getting there, I am going to introduce you to um, this thing we're gonna call the Hadamard extension of a matrix. So remember for the purpose, I wanna remind you that um, this little m here is always going to be this n by k matrix, basically the parameter matrix that describes the behavior of each individual variable. So now a little bit of definitions. If I have two row vectors, so m1 and m2 would be like the, the first and second row, let's say, of that matrix. Their Hadamard product is just the kind of the pointwise product, right? So the youth entry of the u, remember, is ranging from 1 to k, kind of horizontally in the row. The youth entry of that row is the product of those two numbers. So that's the Hadamard product, sometimes called sure product, usually called product. Um, 
So what's the Hadamard extension of this N by K matrix? It's the matrix I get by doing this kind of operation across all subsets. Okay, so the first row of the matrix is where I took the empty set. So the first row of the matrix, the Hadamard extension is always just gonna be all ones because I took the empty set. And then I have a bunch of more rows, which are the original matrix where all the singleton sets. And then I'd start having Hadamard products of pairs and I, I can, I can, I can, any subset, okay? So, uh, so I'll call this, you know, uh, Blackboard H, you know, M sub S is the capital S row out of these two to the N uh, uh, um, uh, rows. Okay. okay, so is it clear what the Hadamard extension is? Here's an example. I started with a matrix M that has two rows uh, and I have here two to the two uh, rows with the empty set, the original rows, and then their product row. So this matrix, uh, we're the ones who call it Hadamard extension, but it already shows up in the Chen Moitra paper. It plays a key role in that paper. So why do we care about this matrix? Well, these are exactly the things that, um, that give you, you know, observables, because what can you observe? If you take the Hadamard matrix, so it's, it's this very tall thing, it's just two to the n by k matrix, right? And if I just multiply it by the column vector of the priors, I'm gonna get this vector of length two to the n. And those are exactly the observable probabilities. Those are for every subset of the variables, the product that they all, the probability, probability that they all come up heads, that everything in that subset. So this is exactly kind of the information that you have access to is this column vector because you don't know those two things. But, but this gives you a kind of a nice understanding of what, what you have access to. So although we know the left-hand side, but we don't know this decomposition on the right-hand side, we're going to be able to uh, still kind of get to it. Uh, able to still use this. So, it's, so there's gonna be two things happening in the algorithm or uh, work, let's say. Um, one is how to use it if you had it perfectly, uh, if you, you had H of M, let's say perfectly. Um, but then there's also the question of how stable all these things are under perturbation because we want <coughs> sample size bounds. So I'm actually gonna kind of reverse things and just tell you what the stability results are first. It's a little more convenient. And then tell you after that, what the algorithm is. So these are the kind of two main things that we show. So, um, so the, here's, here's a, a, a general lemma on condition number of Hadamard extensions. Um, it says, if I take any set of um, K minus one rows of M that are zeta separated, okay? So there are these variables, they're all, they're each, they each satisfy this zeta separation condition. Now, and I take, and I form the Hadamard um, extension uh, just on that on that subset A. Okay, so this is M restricted to A. I mean, they take those K minus one subsets and I just form the Hadamard extension of them. So it's going to have two to the K minus one rows, this matrix. Then the least uh, singular, or the, the K singular value, the, the, the last one that's significant of this um, Hadamard extension is singly exponential in, in zeta. Okay, so that's, that lower bound is crucial. That kind of is going to translate very quickly into a sample complexity upper bound. This is basically kind of a pretty far generalization of the stability results for the unit for the for the IID case, the real line case. Um, it's kind of a multivariate generalization. Although I don't don't, don't pin me down on how that, but. It, for, what was crucial for the mixed IID problem was that the, was a kind of stability of the Vandermond matrix that translated to stability of the Henkel matrix. And here it's a very similar story. The, stabi the stability of the Hadamard extension, this stability of the Hadamard extension is like stability of the Vandermond and it'll translate into stability of another matrix we'll see in just a moment that's used you know, in the algorithm that's kind of like a generalization of the Henkel. So, um, there's another result I want to use now to make the talk easier. Well, this is not actually how the algorithm best works, but uh, there's a, just a beautiful lemma that uh, also I like to show people things that are really kind of fundamental. There's a beautiful lemma um, the, by Fabio Donald Severdio that says if you have an R by K matrix, 
so R is at least K, then, and you want to know, and it, and, and it has substantial, uh, uh, substantial singular value. So it has a lower bound on the, on the, on the K singular value, like, like we have here in lemma three. Then it's always possible to find a, a square submatrix that also has large condition number. Okay, this is not at all obvious. Um, and it's a beautiful proof. Uh, so we'll just get it. So one thing we can do, although it's not the best way to run our algorithm, and I'll, but I'll talk it through that way anyway, is uh, pretending we did that and we're just working with K by K matrices at some point, although that's not the best way to do it. So the, cor the corollary then is that our matrix, which we've just shown a, a singular, uh, I'm sorry, a, a condition number bound for or bound on the K singular value, um, still has essentially uh, has a k by k symmetric, which is essentially the same guarantee on the singular value. The, the loss factor is, is trivial here. So now, in a, uh, there's a different way of arranging these values, that, these observables. Instead of observing them in a long column vector, we can actually form this matrix, which is formed by taking the Hadamard extension and um, you know it's column times the diagonal, the priors, and then hit again by the transpose of the Hadamard extension. But not all of this matrix is well-defined because there are cases where you're um, wanting to square you know, some variable, but you can't square a variable, you only see it once. So um, part of this matrix is observable. It's first column, for example, is observable because any place where the row set and the column set are disjoint is observable. So uh, if R and R prime have the empty intersection, then the C sub R, R prime entry is just the probability that all the, those variables in that set, are, they're all uh, equal to one. And if I take subsets A and B of the observables that are disjoint, then I can observe the entire kind of generalized Hankel matrix spanned with rows taken from A and columns taken from B. So now I have this great big square matrix um, and I can have guaranteed through the previous slide, basically, that each of those contributions have, have good condition number and therefore also the whole thing is going to have a good condition number. So we can form this whole matrix and, and give it a, a guaranteed condition number. How do I use it? So that was the kind of stability, the condition numbers, the stuff that I wanted to talk about. And the other thing I want to tell you about before the time, my time is up is um, the algorithm. So we haven't said anything about the algorithm and how it is that we're going to aggregate information from these completely unrelated variables into some, some kind of a thing. And we are actually going to reduce to k-mix IAD. So we are actually going to reduce to the case where they actually all the variables were IAD. How do we do that? So this is this method of synthetic bits and similar ideas. You know, I just was talking about some things. So, um, so if you fix any two disjoint A and B and you have this well-conditioned CBA, um, you can, uh, we, we're going to, we, you see here, I, 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 wanna, I wanna synthesize a copy of, so I take my sets of A and B and I have one row, I have one variable that's left out. I have enough variables so that I, I have K minus one a in A, K minus one in B, and then I have more variables left over. In the worst case, just one, but in fact, I'm assuming I have even K minus one left over. And I wanna mimic one, the behavior of one of those rows, one of the ones I held out. So what I do is I compute its moments by passing it through A. Okay, so the idea is here. I can look, I can compute, for example, the expectation of you know, that first row by just hitting this row M1 that describes its parameters with the diagonal and then just the all ones. That's like the first column of CBA. And you know, the way of thinking about it in terms of synthetic variables, I wish I had another V1 prime variable that was IID to V1. And I don't. If I did, I could compute this, the Hadamard extension, the Hadamard product of M1 with itself times the same sort of things. And that would give me the expectation of V1 squared. I don't, but I'm going to synthesize it. So the idea for synthesizing it is that, look, this V1 vector, this is a vector, this is a row vector, um, I, is what I would get, not by just looking at the expectation of V1, that, if we go back to the previous slide, that was just like the first entry but I can actually get the entire long row here. And this, now I'm in a world where I'm full rank. So there's only sort of one way to get V1 and I can synthesize a copy of it 
by mapping that vector back under the inverse of CBA, getting a family of parameters that synthesize a copy of M1, and then mapping it forward to, uh, to get uh, this, this V2 that I care about. Okay, so that gives me a second moment of one of my rows. So now it's as if I had two IID copies of that row. And I could keep doing this. Once I have that vector for the second moment, I can carry it back, get parameter, get a, 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 rep a synthetic representation of that, and then hit it again with V1 and keep going forward and backward and forward and backward. So that, that kind of zigzagging back and forth uh, lets me manufacture any moment that I want of V1 as if I had a bunch of IID copies of it. So I do this 2K minus one times, and then I could just apply the Kmax IID problem. So it's a crucial here that control the operator norm of this inverse. It's crucial here to control the operator norm of this inverse. We showed that that's bounded by zeta to the K. So if you do this operation that I just described, you pay every time. And if you do it the way I just described, you're gonna now have, you know, kind of a composite instability your condition number of all these is going to be one over zeta to the k squared. So I was probably missing you I would avoid. So now's the riddle to the audience. Let's see the way around this. This is the part you leave for the homework. So you can do um, repeated squaring. Okay, so I showed you how to get from a first moment to a second moment, and then I went from the second to the third. But why should I go from the second to the third? I can go from the second to the fourth. This is why I need 3K minus three bits and not 2K minus one, because I wanna, I have to kind of do this with two separate sets of, so, okay. So um, we can go from the first moment to the second moment to the fourth moment, all the way up to the 2K minus one, one moment. And then we only pay log, then we only pay for this condition number log times. And that proves the theorem that I promised. Uh, in terms of um, future work, um, we should definitely be doing this problem also in transportation distance, just like we did for KMX IID. One should go definitely want to solve this uh, in transportation costs is a reasonable, uh, what exactly you want to achieve there. I'm not exactly sure, but it's sort of, it's sort of a clear open problem that I don't have not necessarily you know, want to say formally. Um, but the question, there's a big question there. As I mentioned to you, the the Feldman, Donald, Servetio, and the Chen and Moitra papers still have this, this K cubed in the exponent, um, which is um, pretty un unpleasant given that we only know exponential in K uh, lower bounds. And um, so there's a question of whether that, that could be done. Uh, there's a question of what, what uh, again, a vague question where parametric models, you know, how, what's the equivalent of this kind of results for parametric models? Um, and then what to do with multiple confounders. So I've, all, I've been dealing with a single con cardinality bound confounder and what do you do with multiple? Variables being binary necessary? Not really, I, I, don't, I don't know a beautiful, um, um, kind of like here's the beautiful thing to do. There's a there's a really easy kind of way around this, which is you just um, partition, you just partition whatever subframe you have, treat it as several bits. Um, it's kind of an ugly way of doing it. Um, instead of the Hadamard extension, you do get a natural algebraic object, which is now a tensor. So it's solvable, but I, there's probably a more beautiful solution than the one that I have there. <laughs> Um, is there a connection to the kind of work of people like Elizabeth Ullman? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a connection to the work of people like Elizabeth Ullman and John Rhodes on the expression you had with like the left side and then the diagram pi and then the right side it looks very like a matrix flattening, as they call it, where you sort of take the states of some variables and that's the row and the states of the other variables and that's the columns. And then that matrix has to have a, a low rank constrained by the, the So maybe this is what I don't know. So John Rhodes and John Rhodes of, of Berkeley, the 
No, uh, I think they're in Alaska. Um, yeah, I can point you yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ben Stumfeld has done a lot of work on that as well. Okay, so there's a. I was still talking about the learned about these things recently. So, uh, well, we get out of here all. Let, let's talk later. Sure. Oh, okay, so I already have my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can uh, well, uh, thank Leonard again. Now, we'll listen to Yuval Ravani uh, from Hebrew University.